doesn't. Jyoti Gupta, in conversation with Punita Roy, with recitations by Joan Mays and Meli Zararni T. Selva. Both of them will be signing their books after the session, which is right here by the book signing area. You can grab your copies, and they'll be signing their books. Thank you. No, I need to introduce the session. OK. Are we using these mics? Yes. OK, great. Hello, welcome, everyone. Good morning. The session that we're doing today is a session that examines the narratives of skin color and the privilege stroke oppression within society and media. And this is a systemic problem that happens every day. Sometimes it's in your face. Sometimes it's subliminal messages that perhaps we're not even aware of that we are passively receiving and in a way endorsing. To talk about this today, we have Jyoti Gupta, who's a media activist and founder of the Col Colorism Project. It's an initiative that aims at shifting skin color narratives in the media from profitable to equitable. Jyoti brings a Indian perspective to the worldwide practice of skin color discrimination. And she's going to share some very interesting stories from media and from our own lives, which actually highlight what she's trying to address. Jyothi has been awarded uh, the prestigious Individual Artist Grant by the city of Houston to curate an art and media show entitled Putting the You in Color, where she highlighted media's insidious influences on our daily skin color related decisions. And along with me, I have Jovan Myers, an emeritus poet laureate of Aurora, Colorado. He's a national poetry slam champion, curator of a story, which is a student narrative project in Aurora Public Schools, a TED speaker and director of Your Writing Counts, which is a youth poetry program that engages about 200,000 students throughout Denver. Welcome, Joan. And not, to, not the least is Melitarana Selvi, Selva, sorry. Melis Rana Selva. <laughs> She's a spoken word poet, journalist, and poetry educator from Kuala Lumpur. Welcome. She's performed in several countries with notable performances at TEDx Gateway in Mumbai. And she's the founder of Kuala Lumpur's monthly spoken word poetry open mic, If Walls Could Speak. Oh, I'm sorry, it said speak there, all right. If Walls Could Talk a bilingual poetry slam, slam okras, how do you pronounce that? Slam okras, frasi, okay. And the teacher's performance poetry at international and national schools. Welcome, Mel Zarani. Okay, so we're going to start off with Jovan sharing a poem with you on the topic of colorism. Uh, hello, everybody. Happy Monday to you. Um, I uh, started to kind of going on, on a deeper investigation of, of blackness um, um, in response to uh, uh, the treatment of um, young black athletes, um, specifically the higher uh, um, qualification levels that they're held to sometimes. And um, it came up to me in, in one moment that I was... Um, operating with where there's this professional football player um, for the Seattle Seahawks by the name of Richard Sherman, um, who was held to a very racial accord by one of my, um, my um, former friend's mothers on Facebook. And this um, single action kind of prompted me to um, move into an investigation of um, blackness and what is the acceptable blackness to white America and what is not acceptable versions of blackness. So this poem's called Black Like. In the wake of Compton-born Stanford graduate Richard Sherman's post-game rant, my high school football's teammate's mother offered a sentiment via Facebook. It reads, Richard Sherman, what a piece of shit. This is what happens when you let them out the ghetto. Huh. I bet you want me to be a particular kind of black, don't you, ma'am? Not the threatening kind. 
Not the angry woman going off at Walmart. Not boys arguing on the bus stop. You know, the kind that's not dark enough to eat you. The kind that won't swallow you to make direction become unknown. I bet you want a type with stars in it. Dressed in Bill Cosby sweaters and Oprah suits, but not like the ocean's bottom, the coffee with cream, the I have a dream type of black. And I bet you want me proper speaking. Pants above my ass and slacks kind of black. You know, calypso. Not quite Garvey or Marley, but don't worry, be happy. Let's get up, stand up. Just black enough for you to pose in a picture with on your vacation to Jamaica. Instagram shot with an African baby, black. I bet you want me to twerk at the art gallery while you drink white wine on first Fridays. And I bet you want the type of black to win you Super Bowl, but not Richard Sherman, black. Heck, not Jameis Winston, black. Heck, not Deshaun Jackson, black. Just black enough to still be cute. That's so raven black. Adoptable black, but not black enough to scare you. Just black enough so that your kid can wear his football jersey. Not make you walk, clutch purse in a hurry. I bet you want grandma of wisdom black, your black friend, your black coworker, the black person that you use as an example every time you want people to believe that you're not racist. Quick question. When a black male tells a white lie, do we call this perjury? Or when a white lie blackmails a black male, do we call this history? So when a white male tells a black lie, what do we call this? Donald Trump, your father, whatever let the Klan fall out of your mouth on Facebook, ma'am, herein lays the problem. Ladies who have decided that their tongues are not worth checking want young men like Jameis Winston to take speech development classes, Richard Sherman to be less Compton and more Stanford. And I know what lives inside of you. We've seen your fangs and water hose saliva before. We've seen you throw fire and try to extinguish it with apology as if the wind had it picked up. I want to tell every young athlete to go be as black and beautiful as overexposure will let you. So go ahead, Serena. Crip walk all over the U.S. Open. LeBron, Harlem shake all over the NBA championship. Gabby, rock a natural atop Olympic podiums and be blasphemous black until Michelle and Barack rock soul frozen fist picks until nappy-headed boys and girls realize that when they win the Super Bowl or the national championship, that it is in fact their moment. So quote God, quote Brother Malcolm, quote Ali, tell them that you're the greatest until they cringe so strong that they spill out all of their ugly until their Twitter pages swell up like Emmett Till in the mouth of the Tallahatchie because because we know at the base of this is fear, and trust me, ma'am, black those fear. Black those fear. We know the rows upon rows of shark teeth that you were born with, ma'am. We know how your, rosewood whips, how your rosewood whispers can rumble like a southern manhunt, ma'am. We know what it feels like to walk to your gated communities with hoodies on. I bet, bet it feels a whole lot like you must feel walking through our hoods, except I don't recall anybody taking your life. So tighten up your aprons. Because we're not black enough to leave fingerprints. We are not black enough to eclipse your sun. Thank you. Wow. wow. Thank you, Jovan. Okay. I'm going to hand over the mic to Jyoti, who's prepared a very interesting interactive presentation. Jyoti, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to jump right into an interactive presentation. Uh, a session, a quick interactive session to keep in uh, with the energy that jo Jovan has just created. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? And by way of show of hands, um, I would like you to respond to the question. Could we have Jyoti's presentation, please, her first slide? All right. Ne the next one, please. All right. So this is uh, a mom of a six-week-old baby asking her community of other mothers that she wants to lighten her daughter's skin. And what can she do? So could, uh, by way of show of hands, could you tell me how many of you felt like you were judging the mother? OK, thank you. And uh, how many of you felt like there was a larger context to her dilemma? OK, thank you very much. Next slide, please. Um, this is a probability question for high school students in the state in Uttar Pradesh, and uh, pro I never understood probability. But basically, what sh uh, the, the question is asking students to do is to calculate the probability of finding a light-skinned, wealthy girl. So, how many of you felt like this question? You know, it was just it just happened, like it was just something that happened. It was accidental or it's fine. Nobody? OK, how many of you feel that um, these kind of messages are 
so into our system that they are happening around us and we pick on them. We sometimes we pick them up, sometimes we don't pick them up. Okay, great, thanks. Next slide, please. Um, this is from the US media. All these examples are from the media and they kind of set the context for our conversation today uh, of how skin color discrimination surrounds us, not only in culture, but also in media. And so this is from US media and uh, what you, who you see on the uh, left is uh, Ananya Vinay who won the National Spelling Bee competition in 2017 and she's being interviewed on CNN and she's asked to spell a nonsense word that President Trump kind of made up on Twitter uh, a few days ago and so she went, when Ananya Vinay fails to spell it accurately because there is no such word. Um, Alison Camarota tells her, well, you know, this is the correct spelling of the word, but that's okay because the root of this word is not in Sanskrit, which is probably what you're used to using. And so when she said that to her, I think she forgot that Ananya Vinay is the champion and she's been doing this for like five years and she knows language, she knows etymology, she knows how words are born and shaped through centuries. And uh, so how many of you would have noticed that? How many of you did notice it? Um, yeah, and it, do you think it's like humorous or just lighthearted humor? No, okay, do you think like it's irris is irresponsible? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Roy. Uh, and so, right, so these are some of the conversations that are being had online. And I want to talk quickly about um, the term colorism and kind of define it. It's rooted uh, in black scholarship author, poet Alice Walker coined the term in 1982 to explain these kinds of phenomenon, which I'll just talk about in a minute. And she defined it as preferential or prejudicial treatment of same race people based solely on their skin color. And so what that means is that when we meet somebody and when we see um, the color of their skin, we make a lot of implicit judgment on uh, stereotype them about who they are, what they know, where they live, what they do, and you know, we kind of judge them in that way. And um, in, in, in the context of uh, India, you know, we also try to um, judge them on the caste basis, right? Because there are some beliefs uh, in our culture that tie skin color to caste. And, uh, and of course, in recent incidents, as well as historically, color does become a filter or a screen to enact violence on people, as we have seen in some of the anti-blackness that emerged in Delhi with the Nigerian um, students and other students from Africa. And we've also seen that happen in the US, more so in the last uh, you know, four or five years in a, in a different kind of way. Um, and of course, race and color are kind of closely tied together, but I'm going to try to talk specifically about color in a bigger way today. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, so Jyoti, if we could start with your colorism project, you know, and the focus on media. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, how long have you been working on this? What is the research? And specifically to do with media, what have you come up with? Yes, absolutely. So I, my first project on colorism was around 10 years ago as a research paper during my master's in media studies in New York. And uh, colorism, as so I've been doing other work, um, but the colorism project was launched like three or four years ago. And it is a twofold initiative. The first thing is to, I mean, the, the descriptor that we use for the colorism project is shifting the media narrative on skin color from profitable to equitable. And implicit in that definition is the fact that there is the media are somewhere um, kind of uh, happy to keep, that is my critique, that the media are happy to keep a kind of a status quo and uh, it somehow it benefits them. Now it could benefit them either because of the powers that be, you know, who believe in hierarchical structures based on skin color, based on privilege, based on, uh, you know, class status and caste status. And it is also, uh, a big role to play in this is the you know, billion dollar uh, skin lightening industry, which uh, has only been growing. And uh, it's not even a comprehensive figure but it does, because it does not include lots of other ways people lighten their skin. And the second thing the Colorism Project really tries to do and wants to do is 
um, you know, broaden the narrative, broaden the discussion about colorism and talk more about and have an intersectional approach where we are looking at, uh, you know, not just upper class, upper caste problems and issues that get depicted in the media all the time, but also look at how colorism affects people along the axis of class, of gender, of, um, you know, caste, of course, race, of course. And uh, so just to take an example to explain what I mean is that if it's a wealthy, upper class Delhi girl, for instance, who's looking for work, she's English speaking and she's dark skinned, her oppression or her, her, her colorism experience is very different from somebody who's living in perhaps uh, a smaller town and, you know, they may not speak uh, the English that well and is also struggling for similar jobs, you know. Right. And so that is something uh, that, you know, I, I think um, that's where, like, we come in, activists, scholars, academics, poets, uh, and, and audiences to intervene and kind of break that chain of, you know, propagation. Right, right. right. Uh, and so we're all aware of the campaign that, you know, the Fair and Lovely campaign, in which now, I don't know whether you have that uh, in the US, Jovan, you know, we have a cream called Fair and Lovely, uh, which now is also, you have men coming into it. Yeah. I mean, you have uh, Bollywood stars who are the ambassadors of Fair and Lovely for men. Yeah. You know, so um, I don't know whether I can just bring them in two minutes, you know, to just comment whether you... Do you have any similar sort of, I'll give you this, yeah. Any similar kind of uh, body products or skin, you know, lightening products in the US which are so overtly named as being fair and lovely and not dark and beautiful. We don't have a dark and beautiful product. Not yet. <laughs> um, I'm not, not, that, not that I'm privy to. Um, um, I certainly, uh, yeah, I, I don't know of any cream like that. I wouldn't want any cream like that. That sounds really scary um, and weird. Uh, uh, so I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'll comment on the fact that I don't, I don't think that folks should, 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 should be putting themselves inside of that type of practice, but I do understand how that works. I do recall it works the other way. I have a very light-skinned sister um, who was growing up in a black community who wanted to be more black to be inside of that community, right? Um, but she did not rub no stuff on her skin. I don't know about that. But, um, but certainly I do recall her asking those, having those questions with my mother about how can I be more black um, inside of this space, so. Very interesting, yes. Mm -hmm. um, can I have the next slide, please, as we move along? Yeah. Uh, as far as the media are concerned, um, as I said, it has become a billion dollar industry. And uh, that's kind of also, Punita, where my critique comes in about the media, that, uh, you know, there's all this chest thumping uh, articles that you read in the media all the time about men's fairness product market is going from 20 to 50. 30% increase, and it's such a nascent market, only started in 2007, but it's grown so fast, you know? And uh, there's also like all this um, information about, uh, you know, products, new products being launched and natural products being launched and so on. Um, but I wanna talk about why no one talks about uh, the range of products that's come out. If some of you might know that there was a vaginal lightening cream that was launched a few years ago, and there was a big furor about it. Feminists spoke about it. You know, I'm sure there were people uh, along, um, you know, certain people who got offended because, you know, such a word is not very public in, in our culture yet. And so, but my question is that there was all this hue and cry, but what about the 80 different other products that have been launched in the last, like, eight or 10 years, which are, like, eye concealers, which are skin lightening. There's things to lighten your armpits, you know, there's full body moisturizers, and there's no talk about that. So, you know, are we sensationalizing the issue or are we really digging deeper? Uh, another, another example I'd like to offer is of um, one of the leading manufacturers in the country. I will leave it nameless. And uh, they have been doing like a major rural push because of all these multinationals who have entered the skin lightening product industry. And I saw some of their um, uh, you know, spots on YouTube, and the age of the model 
which used to be like 18 to 21 year old in the past, since the 80s, you know, of a, of a newly wed uh, woman or you're trying to get married. But in that one, you know, the model is actually competing for a music uh, real reality show. And she's a teenager. You know, and that really talks about, like, nobody complained about that. You know, nobody criticized it. Do we really want our teenage daughters to get influenced by, like, skin lightening products, which are not safe, have mercury levels that are higher than they should be, as was um, a CSE did a research study a few years ago, and they found that, I mean, it's not one of those things that will burn your skin, right. uh, you know, which there are products like that out there in other parts of the world. But, uh, but this one doesn't do that, but it does have more than the approved levels of mercury. So Can yeah. I just ask Medizurani here. I mean, is color an issue in Malaysia? Most definitely. It is? Yeah. yeah. Um, so in Malaysia, we have three communities. Uh, the Indian community makes up 7%. Uh, the Chinese community makes up about 25 and then the rest are Malay. And um, we're all relatively brown when you think about it. But within the community itself, there is a lot of um, discussion on, um, on the spectrum of brown, how okay. dark and how light you are. Right. And I think that um, the, the people that other me that decide that I'm others are my own community. Within the Indian community itself, they are the ones selling to us girls right. that we should be lighter. My mother became a beautician. She, uh, she was the one who taught me how to put my face on. And putting my face on means two different types of whitening creams and a layer of baby powder. So. This is, the, this is the construct that we live in, in Malaysia. And we're not competing to be Caucasian. We're not trying to be whiter. We're trying to be fairer amongst our, our, our own Indian community. Wow. So, yeah. And that's definitely a sign of beauty. The fairer you are, then you're considered more beautiful. Yes, and, and also I, I was thinking about this. Um, so in Malay, uh, if it, white, in, in the proverbs in Malay, the word of white is always associated with Pamaisuri or Raja, which means royalty. The color white is always associated with royalty. But hitam, which is black, is always associated with being adorable or cute. It's always a vague type of beauty that is not necessarily beautiful. And so when I think about how we propagate this culture to our little girls, yeah. uh, we, we're not telling them that um, being darker is beautiful. It's just that being darker makes you less pretty. But what does that even mean? You know? Right, so, yeah. right, right. And I just have a very, sh I, I remember when I actually got married and I'd gone to meet my in-laws. And you're right about the older generation. Um, kind of propagating it down. I remember uh, my husband's great-grandmother. She must have been in her 80s. She was holding my hand, and she was just sort of doing this to my arm, to my, you know. And I wasn't sure what it was, you know. Thank you. And my husband laughed, and later he told me that she was just trying to check whether it was makeup or what my real color was. And I would have not, you know. And I was shocked. I was horrified. In fact, I mean... I remember I cried that day, saying that, is, are we just going to be judged on the, you know, on the basis of our color? Yeah. I mean, it's very demeaning. Yeah? Jyoti, I just want to bring you back. I mean, do you want to go a little more in your presentation, or shall we come to the issue of self-esteem? Um, yeah, sure. There is, I just want to quickly um, go back to the presentation and just define uh, colorism in the way that I have tried to define it. And one of the things that I've tried to do in alignment with the Colorism Project mission is to focus the problem, not necessarily on the darker skinned people. Right. Uh, and so, which, because I think that would further victimize and isolate uh, them and otherize them. Right. And instead I tried to make it a more action driven um, criticism of like light skinned people who are not speaking up about their privilege. And so I defined it as colorism is the practice of um, the conscious and sometimes subconscious misuse of one's light skin as a social privilege. Okay. And you know, and so, so of course it's a systemic problem and you know, it, all of that which we've already talked about, but I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about that. Sure. And as far as your question about self-esteem is concerned, what I want to say really is people tell me all the time, uh, you know, that, you know, in, in conversations always said she's dark skinned and, you know, she's not very confident and so on. Even Nandita Das, who has been such an outspoken leader uh, on this anti-colorism practice in India uh, and worldwide, you know, she's been noticed for that. Uh, but like, 
my question is that, you know, is a person who's genetically dark-skinned genetically insecure? Are they genetically underconfident? No, they're not. It's because you're reminding them every day, every day, you know, five times a day, don't go in the sun, don't drink tea, you know, do not, uh, and when, when, they're sitting, when a girl is sitting and you're talking about beauty, you're talking about other women, you're saying, ha, wo gori chitti sundar si hai. You know, the idea that she's light-skinned and she's very beautiful. Or yeah, wo savla hai. Or wo savla British hai, you complexion, know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. I, I remember speaking to Shovna Narayanji in the early part of my research, and she, she has a skin condition which, made, which changed her complexion, and she said, she said, if I had a dollar for like every story, she said I could write a book that strangers at airports have stopped and told me that, are aapko kya ho gaya? You know, aap kuch kariye, aisa kariye, meri dadi, you know, things like that. So that is a self-esteem question, but I do want to go a little bit beyond uh, the self-esteem uh, okay. thing as well, which is that it's not just about superficiality, you know, the skin color uh, really affects and impacts people's lives in a really, really complete way. You know, it is something that the baggage it's kind of like a baggage that they're carrying from very early age all the way up, you know. And, uh, and it's one of those things where the sum is greater than its parts, right. you know. And that's one thing. And then also, you know, in my last uh, 10 or so years of talking to people, I have found there was this one time when one of the most well-respected um, anti, uh, you know, domestic violence prevention organizations in Houston, you know, the founder was attending one of my talks and she came up to me and said, you know, you don't know how important this is because, you know, in my uh, work, there are so many of our clients who still believe that they're survivors and they still believe that, uh, you know, there's something wrong with their skin. You know, there's also a story, um, I met uh, another woman whose daughter was paraplegic and she was also dark skinned and her own grandmother would, um, you know, cr criticize her openly in front of the whole family saying, and compare her to another cousin and say, well, neither are, neither are you, I'm sorry, I have to say this, um, please forgive me, but it's important that I say it. Yeah. Uh, it might be triggering for some of us, but, uh, and she actually said, neither are you smart, nor are you beautiful. What's going to happen to you, you know? And I mean, that's what she said. And one last story, uh, Youth Ki Awaz did this um, story about Nepali women who are being forced to sell the skin off their back. What? Yeah, they're being forced to sell the skin off their back for cosmetic surgery. And this is cosmetic surgery, which is not for like accidents or disease based. These are just beautification surgeries, you know, like breast augmentation or like other kinds of things like that. And so where are the stories in the mainstream? Why does only Youth Ki Awaz does it? You know, uh, absolutely, what about? Absolutely. And I also the caste, you know, the uh, caste issue. Um, you know, I wanted to qualify this because a lot of our media is talking about post-colonial, like, like, you know, skin color discrimination being a colonial baggage, but that's not entirely true. I think we really need to go back into our uh, own texts, historically, you know, for 2,000 years and even more, go back into art history, go back into anthropology, you know, all of those fields, and look at what were we thinking about, about color before, before the British came. And when I started doing this work, or, and you know, studying the intersection of culture, media, and, uh, and color, and yeah. And so I approached one of the scholars, the Dean of Art and Aesthetics at JNU, and she told me that during her undergrad, she had done a similar study in, at Oxford, and she had found at the time an uh, entire chapter in, um, in the Shilpa Shastras, which are basically art manuals instructing artists how to kind of make art and, you know, teaching them. And so she found an entire chapter on skin color. Um, and it, it, although in the beginning she said that there was a lot of references about <clears throat> color being explained in a very metaphorical and a poetic way with all kinds of skin colors, even like the color of a green bean, Mugdha Shama. But she found one instance in which the Shudras, who are the so-called lowest caste yeah. in the hierarchical caste system in India, uh, to be shown not only dark-skinned, but also diminutive in stature and also cross-eyed. Wow. And so that kind of tells you about, you know, how the dominant culture influences our perceptions. And she also said that, you know, these are Brahminic texts 
and they tend to naturalize the Brahminic belief system. And so that really kind of ties it in for me as a media scholar about you know, the similarity between the mainstream media that time, which yeah. was the Shilpa Shastras, because they were propagating you know, a belief right. up to now. You know? and, and so where is our role in it, in all of that? So this is a belief that's come down through the centuries. We tell, today I meet people all the time who tell me like if it's a fact, but it's, there is no basis to that uh, kind of. Okay. I'd like to bring Melissa Rani in here as a performance poet, uh, responding to the issues of self-esteem and whether, I mean, I, does the caste system prevail in Malaysia? I, not so much. Um, I don't think the caste system was uh, transmitted um, along, with the a, along the migration to Malaysia, but we do, um, or maybe to an extent. So in Malaysia, uh, we measure the color of your skin based on where exactly you come from. So if you're lighter skin, then you must be Malayali or Punjabi or Gujarati. Good for you, it means that you're rich. Um, if you're darker skinned colored, it means that you're South Indian or you're from Tamil Nadu. Or worst case, you're mixed with Sri Lankan blood. That's a whole other thing. So I think within the Tamil community, in Malaysia, there is a lot of uh, a lot of hierarchy and levels and layers that we need to kind of um, uh, try to discriminate. Really, yeah, st stand our ground and, and, and do so. So, yeah. Great. Would you like to share a poem sure, with us? I'd love to. Yay, poetry! <laughs> Joanne, thank yes. you for your patience. Uh -huh. oh, this is great. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. All right. So, so when I think of color, uh, three things come to mind. The first thing is um, uh, this is this is a face of a book. And when I wanted to publish poetry in Malaysia, everybody told me that a brown girl will not sell a book, so don't put a photograph of a brown girl. So I painted it. And then um, the the second thing that I think about of color is that in my country we have to tick what race we are in government forms until today. So I always have to take Indian, and even though the color of the paper is white, a person already knows what color is my skin before I even enter the room, and that is problematic. And uh, of course, the third thing I remember is my mother told me that if I'm going to fulfill the desire of every man, I must use whitening cream twice a day. Uh, I have not listened to my mother. So um, this, this poem is called, I struggle, uh, is called Indianity. I struggle with my identity, or should I say my Indianity, though I proudly tick Indian on tiny checkboxes of forms trying to fit me into a category, yet I am nothing but a statistic if the category denies me. Denying my stubborn tongue, taking after the tyrants who colonized my ancestors instead of my mother's own tongue. It's not my fault that you're sensitive and highly strung because I call my appa daddy because Melissa is so English before it ends with Rani. Do I need to eat on banana leaves with my hands to pledge allegiance to the baya next to me, or will I forever be condemned to being a minority of the minority who would rather order dosa in Malay because she can barely count to three without getting cringes, flinches, and stares? Wuna, renda, muna. And you laugh at me, tease me to my face and curse my family who raised a girl who wore dresses instead of saris. At weddings where I should be paired to my husband-to-be, alas, it is my chastity that you question because no black potu decorates this forehead of ambition. Get straight A's for PMR, SPM, all the final exams for the community and make the quota. Go to university, be a doctor and make us proud, Kanna. We Indians must stick together and be there for each other. But on my graduation day, you tell me MassCom is not in favor. My degree can't make me an engineer, but I can read your news. Vanakam, say the Galvasapudin, Nandan Ungal, Milizarani. So teach me, and I will say more than the introduction. Give me a chance to make up for my A plus English tuition. Despising the language, you so crudely mentioned the lack of my ability and questioned my spirituality when you're the one who taught the people a string of your native obscenities. My bloodlines run deep. 
along the rivers of the holy Ganga to Tamil Nadu, Bangalore, and Karnataka. I may not kneel and pray like you, but I believe in karma, which I thought you did, but you stuck to bar brawls and self-righteous gangsters. Yes, I know you didn't do it. Must you take to the streets to prove your innocence, wave your picket signs and throw stones at the government representatives who you claim know nothing of your plight and woe because they built the Tamil schools you refused to go, sponsored your babies and businesses, and fought corruptly to make a stand that we are significant as an 8%. And they said, Nambike, trust that tomorrow will be a better day. But trust is blind when that is the only Tamil word you can say. To cover empty promises and get your vote with free biryani dinners. They're no saints because we're all sinners. While they're greedy for power, we're only greedier. Not enough, we holler, for more temples, festival holidays, and discounts for my brother who chose the parang, a machete to hail Rajini and easy money because it paid the bills and he couldn't sit through a law degree. Forgive me, but hell hath no fury like a woman scorned because she chose friends lighter than her shade of brown or darker on the color palette from white to black. And you frown at me, wondering why I didn't stick to the clan. The Indian boy was good enough, but I wanted a man. And I watch you grinding your teeth, chewing at what is hard to swallow, at principles and traditions you don't understand but follow, knowing that you would be frowned upon if you told me to befriend my own kind, but you already are, because when your Malayali daughter brings home a Punjabi, it's not fine. But I hold out my hand towards you, seeking your acceptance beneath my frustration and expensive education to read our history, locate our past, and affirm the present. Change the dim future and light the pathway for our descendants. So look at what you have in the palm of your hands and look no further. We've sat down too long at Dabas over Nescafes, blaming each other for what we can't have, don't have, should have, when we already have the human ability to succeed in all that we choose to be, remember that a community with problems is different than a problem community. Mm. Between Bharatanatyam spins and tabla beats, you and I are no different. So polish your cultural armor and let old grudges go. Life may be rough, but it need not be a ZTV drama episode. Though I didn't climb Everest or start an airline, I can't make dal curry to save my life, and I'm not divine. But accept me as I accept you with arms open wide, because I choose to tick Indian as I am on the inside. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Thank you, Melody Rani. The power of words to express and to trigger, to catalyze. Thank you. That was very, very moving. Thank you. Um, so Jyoti had this idea that we just open this up to a few interactions where if anyone from the audience wants to share experiences of observations from media, yeah, yeah media observations, it's not the Q&A, it's just sharing media observations from your own context. Could we just have some mics around quickly? And next slide, uh, just a moment actually, just wait for the next slide. So we've already talked a little bit about, uh, we've talked about Colorism, we've talked about the misinformation that's out there. We've talked about how the media are painting colorism as a social problem. And so, uh, so essentially the question is, how is media representing colorism? And is there something wrong with it? What is wrong with it? How can we become more media literate and create a conversation that is deep and that can actually cause some more intellectual critical thinking and start a cycle of change. We can't do it without countering the media narratives. So we're gonna take four examples and we'll have one person from the audience respond. I'm sorry, it'll probably just have to be one person from the audience respond, but you have to wait till you see the actual uh, clip or the actual slide. Uh, so we'll have the next slide, uh, please. Okay, play. This is a Dove commercial. Uh, mu s sound, please. In a country of 631 million women, there is still only one face of beauty when there is so much more to be admired. Let's 
break the rules of beauty. Okay, so who wants to respond to that ad? The question is, tell me one thing that works in that ad um, and tell me one thing that doesn't work in that ad within the context of the discussion we've had today. One person. Uh, you can get the gentleman with the muffler. Yeah. Okay. The thing that doesn't work in the video is they are associating beauty with skin color, which shouldn't be the case. And one thing which works, in my opinion, is uh, they are also celebrating, I mean, at least from the ad, diversity in terms of skin color. These are two observations. Yeah, right. exactly. So Thank that's you. right. Thank you. So Dove has been doing these real beauty campaigns all over the world, and they are really pushing the limits of what beauty means. But, uh, but I, I hope that they will continue to do that more and more and include a slightly more diverse range of, you know, even darker, darker, darker brown. Uh, brown skinned women in their campaigns. Uh, could we have, thank you for the answer, that's a, that's a good answer. Can I have the next slide please? Um, so this is a biopic made uh, about Silk Smitha and Vidya Balan starred in it and um, uh, did folks here familiar with this film? Yes, okay, so uh, what do you feel, uh, the same question, what do you think is missing or not been done right by Bollywood, not done right by Silk Smitha in this film. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So instead of taking a Bengali Brahmin, it would have been so easy to cast someone from the same community and the same region and the same subracial community. Can you be a bit louder, please? Yeah, that's it's on. Uh, so should I repeat the whole? Yeah. Thing? Can you uh, just stand? Maybe we. Okay, so uh, instead of casting a Bengali Brahmin, it would have been so easy to uh, cast someone from the same uh, region and the same sub-racial community that Silksmitha came from. That's exactly right, yes. And also, uh, that's the first thing. And then there's also the, uh, the fact that Silksmitha had a somewhat tragic life. If you all know, she ended her life. That's or it, some people also claim that it was plotted, but she had a tragic life. She was not doing as well as she could have done. She was in huge debt, and her color and her cast really played into her career. And that was completely removed from the narrative. The narrative all became about uh, Vidya Balan putting on weight for the film. It was very, um, it was very sultry, and you know the display was. It was very uh, sexualized. It was called one of her boldest roles. It was called she a bold role, which yeah. in fact it was the opposite of a bold role because she completely rewrote the story of Silk Smitha, and uh, you know so that's true. And also it was being opted as a feminist, um, as a feminist agenda kind of film, you know. And that's something we really need to think about. Also, is like when you're talking about feminism. Are we co-opting it or are we really like pushing the limits of, of you know, challenging patriarchy? And also, I do also remember that there was all this UN cry about Vidya Balan putting on weight for this film, but like what about the color, yeah, you know? Absolutely. So that, that was never discussed. And of course, Bollywood has a history of light-skinned actresses since, since the beginning. In fact, right at the start, they even had mostly Jewish. Uh, Indian film um, actresses. Um, so yeah, thank you for the answer. Could we have the next slide? So this is a recent campaign that just launched maybe two weeks ago by a Chennai-based post-production house. And uh, the theme of this campaign has been uh, that divine, uh, divine, dark is divine. Have some of you seen this in the past? Yeah? Okay, so again, one person who feels that this is problematic from a color um, analysis. Uh, I'm the gentleman on, uh, sir, are you raising your hand or are you stretching? <laughs> I can't tell, I can't tell. Okay, someone else? Someone else? Yeah. Someone you at the back? Someone spoken, I someone else. Yeah, there's one gentleman at the back, yeah, you. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. I'm not, I'm not really acquainted with such a campaign myself, but, uh, so, but I had a question in mind. I mean. uh, uh, okay, can you just repeat your question? What was that? We, we can come back to you for your question, though, if you yeah, want. We, we, we just, have just Q a, a bit later. To, if we can stick to the topic. She was talking about the campaign called Dark is Divine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and if you've seen uh, yeah, that... My question is quite related to that as well. It's actually... Okay. 
Yeah. So we have seen uh, some deities um, in Hinduism, particularly uh, associated with the color divine. I mean, Krishna. The word literally means black, Shyam, right? Right. Uh, I had a question in mind. I have never seen uh, an image of Krishna, which is actually dark. They actually associate the color with bluish. Blue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me because you portray a deity as bluish and say that that is dark and you know we are open to different uh, open to deities with different colors and we don't differentiate we don't see God because we create the deities right yeah so we create them as we want to see them right you see them mostly fair color only you see Krishna as dark uh, but that is not dark as well so why is that yeah, so that's a very good question, and it's a question that keeps getting coming up every now and then. Uh, and it's a very important area of research that needs to happen, both in terms of our texts, looking at texts, and how you know the idol, the, the symbolism around Krishna has changed from century to century to century to century, and coming all the way up to the 21st century, where it's come to a point where Krishna is almost being shown as light-skinned through calendar art and and you know so on and so forth. And um, as far as, so I mean, I'm, I, mean I'm, I think we need a lot more research to answer that question correctly as a, in terms of scholarship. But you're absolutely right. I, and I th also think that an, another question to find, ask is, let us say Krishna is dark. And let us say he was born dark. Then why in our culture do we have so many uh, rationalizations and reinterpretations of why he was dark? You've all heard that famous Bollywood song, Radha Kyu Kali, uh, Radha Kyu Gori Me Kyu Kala. And, and there are other bhajans which, and other narratives, you know, I went to the Crafts Museum in Delhi and I met, a, met an artist from Mithila and I asked him that Krishna Kale Kyu Te? So he said, Ki wo isle kale the, kyunki Shesh Nag ne unko dust liya tha. He was dark because a serpent had uh, kind of bit him. And, and the poison darkened his skin. And if you talk to somebody else, somebody else is going to say something else. Devdath Patnayak, who's such a scholar and you know, studies mythology in India and writes extensively about it, recently got trolled uh, when he said that Krishna was a dark god, and it, Krishna literally means dark skinned. Uh, somebody said, no, that's not right. Krishna had a skin ailment. So there's all these narratives going around about wh why can't we just accept that he was a dark god and just show him as a dark god. So it really talks about the double standards that we are kind of creating. Thank you. And not accept. So mythology is, is important. We really need to question. I think that's exactly the point of today's discussion is, you know, how can we question our everyday life choices and every little small acts um, of, of colorist behavior? Next slide. Oh, so yeah, coming back to this slide, I think nobody's answered it. You want, the lady here wants to answer it. You know, I, I'm very, I'm not aware of this uh, campaign, but I'm very happy to see it like this because it is breaking the stereotype. All our goddesses are milky white. Yes. And therefore, this is very commendable and we need to have this kind of atmosphere and environment in the country where dark is divine would perhaps change the way people think. I really country. like, actually you're very right. That's a very positive way to look at it. But unfortunately, the narrative that came with this campaign, uh, uh, you know, they actually said that they want to flip the imagery. They, want, they said that let us do this, but they completely, that's misinformation because like the gentleman there was just saying, and as we know, a lot of our goddesses were dark. We don't know that they were light. So they are creating this cycle of misinformation and using, in my opinion, in my very strict critical opinion, uh, they are using this colorism platform to launch a campaign, right? And that happens all the time. You know, there are uh, social, there are, you know, there are corporates, there are companies co-opting um, feminism, they're co-opting and kind of using that as a vehicle and, and continuing their uh, capitalist or, you know, whatever kind of profitable messages. And coming back to my, uh, thing is like how can we make media more accountable how can we make them not think about profit but really think about equitability um, we have one last slide and then after that we can okay. you know Thank give you. it back to um, next slide please <laughs> um, so if you all know um, that's Yami Gautam and that's her after she launched the fair and lovely campaign because she got trolled a lot and got into a lot of trouble Earlier, last, um, late last year, Alia Bhatt, 
also launched Garnier. Did anybody hear about that? Did anybody hear any criticism about Alia Bhatt? No, did anybody hear criticism about Yami Gautam? Yeah, so the question is how come? And so um, my criti criticism is that like the, the media, I did a paper on this too, and so we have celebrities and then we have A-list celebrities and we have media darlings, you know? And so uh, I think that Alia Bhatt has more privilege coming from her background and her experience, f familial experience in, in um, Bollywood, that she literally got away with doing like not one, but maybe even two ads for Garnier, which are for Skin Lightning, and Yami Gautam really took a lot of flack. So, you know, I mean, what I'm trying to say with that is that we need to continue to inspect and challenge and inspect and challenge. And just because we like Alia Bhatt doesn't mean, you know, I love, I love her acting as well, but it just, you know, doesn't mean that everything she's doing is, is golden. You know, we, we should still question it. Yeah, thanks, that, Jyoti. Thanks. Jyoti, I want you to come in here, you know, from where you come from. We also have this thing of now black power with, you know, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. It's a thing of pride. Uh, <coughs> do these issues still prevail in the America that you are a part of? Um, I mean, I think they absolutely do, I, you know, especially from a systemic standpoint. Yeah. Um, of um, foreseen success, whether you take it back to like Lena Horne or Billie Holiday all the way to like a modern day um, Beyonce is that um, the standards of beauty do sort of lie with a European blend in mind. I think what, I w what I've been thinking about throughout this dialogue is how that exists in um, the tonality of skin, but also extends itself into the what is deemed as quality hair versus non-quality hair. And um, so I feel like when, when, when I went earlier, when you asked me about the, 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 the product, um, I, I couldn't think of a skin product, but I've thought of so many hair products that um, really try their best to straighten out and Europeanize a, um, um, hair to be more susceptible for the, for the force. I mean, look at me, I, I, rock, I rock around with these dreadlocks on my head every single day of my life. I, I, I know the challenges of people wondering if bugs live in my hair or, <laughs> or things like that. And then I think about, um, you know, how that is such a weird existence for, for black women in a dominant part of the, um, of the beauty system subculture right. and, and, and uh, an expensive part of, of the beauty system subculture as well. And so I definitely see how that operates, but you do see a, a big movement, um, um, especially with a lot of um, African-American actresses being of darker skinned, where the power movement, at least inside of what I can see, um, black femininity is coming back to a more natural um, and acceptance of, of, of your skin tonality base. As a male, I never feel like I've really tied myself into too many of these uh, um, mores. I do remember um, folks in my middle school who were very, very dark skinned being ostracized and that being, being, being commented by. I mean, um, um, but, you know, my mom is, is from Jamaica. She's a very dark-skinned woman and a very proud woman. So right. I do think that it, that, that it becomes an issue. But as we had spoke yesterday, it's, it's a multifaceted issue, in, in, at least for me in the black community, where class plays a role in, into it and the hair plays a role into it. And it's, it's a very wide discussion. Yeah. Um, um, and even yeah. as I was asking you that question, I was actually remembering the king of pop, Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. and what he went through. Mm -hmm. You know, the multiple, the multiple operations, the skin lightening, and finally he developed a kind of a yeah, skin cancer, a skin right? He, yeah. he also had a skin condition, okay. which kept okay. making him lighter. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it was a combination. Would you like to, yeah. I, I do have something to add. Um, so I, I, I worked as a journalist in, uh, in Malaysia, and we have, uh, we have, this standard policy that whenever you are interviewing people, it has to be one Malay person, Chinese person, an Indian person. The reason for this is because when the photograph comes out, we have to look like a multiracial community. And the reason, uh, and, and whenever they do this, they, they pick for the darkest Indian boy. 
to put in that so that you can see this comparison. So I think, uh, so when I think about skin color uh, in Malaysia, um, there is this, there is, it's either you're really dark or you're just really fair. So if you want to be in a, in, a, in a commercial advertisement, you have to be fair and have beautiful skin. But if you want to be in a national advertisement, you should be as dark as possible. So um, I, I, I do think that uh, one thing that, you know, if you, if you take away anything, I, I hope is that um, if you're ever interviewed or if you are in the media or if you ever have the opportunity to do a program, an outreach program of any sort um, that gets media attention, please always make sure there are a range of colours in your photographs. It actually makes a difference. Colours of the rainbow. Okay, um, we have I think just two, three minutes for Q&A, and mm -hmm. then I want to just end with you wrapping up of the way forward. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can we open this out to some question and answers? Uh, one question, sir, please. And not a comment, sir, just a question. <laughs> they say black is beautiful. They say black is beautiful. I don't know who invented this thing, mm -hmm. but to be fair, it is still a key to success. But to fair is to still? Fair is still a key to success. Key to success. Because from Madhubala to Yami Gautam and Anushka Sharma, they are all very fair colored and that is why they have succeeded in their life. Not in 50 years time or 20 years time. If whatever, we have our way, whatever if we, we have our way, it won't be dark like skin. that. Whatever we say about dark skin, but the bias is, is definitely likely to continue forever. So that's the prejudice that we are trying to battle. That's right. We meet after 20 years. <laughs> what are Another the question. Yeah. Yeah. The lady in orange. Hello. Hello. Uh, so I'm from Tamil Nadu. I've lived in Delhi all my life. So there's a very recent event that happened to me. I was at a family function sort of a thing with my parents. And uh, I had gone to get food to the buffet table. And this auntie we've known for quite a while, she told me, and I'll say this in Hindi, if you need a translation provided, Vaishwami, you are going to become a beautiful mother. If you are just a little bit of a color, how good it is. So, I shared this. Should I translate it? Yeah. You are becoming a pretty young woman just like your mother. Just if your skin was a little clearer, it would have been better. So, I shared this with a friend of mine, and he asked me, were you okay with it? I said, I just laughed it off. Um, but did it hurt you somewhere? I was like, I don't know. So then he right. said, maybe you've become desensitized to it, and don't you think that's worse? So right. do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I think we, uh, that's a very good question, and thanks for asking, because a lot of times we laugh it off, but I think it's not, it does affect us somewhere. It's, it's, it, it, we carry it, we carry it in our parenting, we carry it in our social interactions, we carry it when we travel, and we don't have to. Um, this is explained as internalized colorism. It's, I mean, it's actually internalized racism, which was a term that was, uh, you know, coined, and it transfers well to colorism as well. And so when we ourselves start believing that something is missing, something is wrong, or we allow it to happen, that is also part of the problem. And that is just internalizing it. And yeah, we need to question it, we need to change it, we need to respond. And we need to say, no, you're wrong. You know, you could have, in another way next time, you know, you can give yourself the freedom and the option and claim your space and your own beauty and say you're wrong. I think I'm perfectly fine. You know, find a way to, hu if, if it's humor that works, if it's, you know, whatever works, whatever tone works, I think you can You need to that. believe in it yourself first. Yeah. Just one more question. Okay, one more question. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back. Yeah, there's a gentleman in the back. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, this concept Could you hold the mic up, sir? We can't hear. This concept of fair is beautiful and attractive starts from a very early age. If you see, all dolls made in India are fair. Yeah. Somebody started a dark colored doll, it never worked. So right. from the beginning, the doll is Gori Chitti Mem Saab. Right. Type. right. That's Maybe right. possible, we have been ruled by British and the white children are very beautiful doll-like. 
Yeah. The same concept we are carrying, and our children from the beginning know white is, white is beautiful. Yes. I've spoken about the caste system and the Brahminical. Yeah, the, there's a caste system, there's the Brahminical system, so it's not just the British, uh, that's one. And then the second thing is that it's basically the products that became available that were sent to India that were being uh, exported, you know, came into our homes, even with the books, lit, you know, children's books and all of that have also been uh, problematic because, you know, they don't represent our culture, they don't represent our houses. And even our own, some of our own books, like the Amachitra Katha, has been recently questioned for their own bias on colorism. And I'm happy to share uh, that article with any of you if you, if you if you reach out. But I do want to talk quickly. Yeah, the just to respond to what uh, the uh, elderly gentleman had said, that it will always be that fair is lovely and fair is beautiful. Jyoti actually has come out with an activity book, which is for parents and children on color. Yes. Would you like to just show the slide? Uh, it's the last Very slide, quickly, but we've run it's out of time. Yeah. The last slide, please. Yeah. Uh, the last slide. So the book is an activity book on skin color. And so to your point, it actually tells children directly, gives straight information about skin color. What is melanin? How do you get your skin color? What is genetics? It's not just, uh, uh, and it's a very fun activity book. There's a cooking activity. There's a drama activity. There's a role play activity. There's a coloring activity. There's 15 completely different kinds of activities. And all the point of those activities is to A, develop an information uh, about, correct information about skin color, and also have cultural pride. You know, cultural affirmation, self-love. Those are the messages that we are trying to give through that book. And it is for five to nine-year-olds. So it is kind of trying to tackle and give an opposition to the mainstream products and media and so on. But can we do a quick wrap up? Okay, uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. To get can off. you please yeah. uh, give me the second last slide with the... I don't think... What's happened to the slides? Oh, the slides are We've not run coming out of time. Up. Okay, so the, coming back to the first three slides that we saw, therein lies the message. The first one is, the, the, you already saw the slide, so the, the three Ds, we have a 3D uh, system that you can take home today. The first is debunk, so debunk old ways of thinking about color. Try to have newer conversations like the lady here was talking about, try to contradict and uh, the, the belief system. This, uh, please, the next um, thing, this is the second one, and this is the probability question, and the D that for this is deconstruct. When you see things around the media, if media is trying to tell you something, think about it. Even if it's not the media, if it's a product, a school bag, a water bottle, you know, anything, think about it, deconstruct what that means, how it's going down your system, how it's going down your child's system, how can you interject, and the third one, is dissent. So this lady, Alison Camarota, had a nationwide, um, you know, she had to make, they had to kind of respond to it and there was like, a, it went viral. The criticism for this went viral. So your Facebook post message counts, your Twitter counts, your criticism of these kind of media things count. So yeah, please dissent. Thank you, thank you Jyoti and good luck for your project. Thank you, Jovan and Melizarani, for being part of this session and really value adding to it. Their books are going to be available. We need to sign. No, no, at, yeah. off, at, off. Signing, at No, no. Time. You talk at here. Please, sir, there. there's a system to it. There is something you said completely wrong, which I think people should know here. Yeah, we, we can have this discussion at the book signing, perhaps. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. To Jovan Mays, Melizarani, Jyoti Gupta, and and for the